Tonight, we are quite honored to have the artist Fergus Feely here from Berlin. Uh, born in Dublin, Ireland, Fergus now lives and works in both Berlin and Helsinki, where he teaches. He received his MFA from Tokyo National University of Fine Arts and Music in 2002. His work, featured in um, exhibitions across the world, is represented by Masako and Rosen, and Rosen Gallery in Tokyo and Gallery Christian um, Lethart in Cologne. Solo exhibitions include The Suburban in Milwaukee in 2015, um, Nothing and Everything at Gallery Christian Lethart in um, 2014, uh, an absolutely stunning show, I have to say, based on the images, um, and two intriguing exhibitions at Douglas Hyde Gallery in Dublin. Um, one, um, The Paradise, um, number 37, in 2012, and in 2009, an exhibition titled Pavilion at the Douglas Hyde Gallery, um, which an exhibition with a premise that intrigues me greatly and with um, a text, um, an accompanying book for which Fergus himself wrote the text, um, which I haven't asked, um, and I should have asked <laughs> uh, Fergus if it was still in print, but if it is, I'm gonna work hard to get it into the modern store so it will be available for all of us. Um, there also, um, uh, the um, exhibition Fergus Feely at Modern Art in London in 2011, for which uh, Martin Herbert wrote an insightful re uh, review for Freeze Magazine. So short of reading you the entire article, because I was so taken with it, um, I'll just tell you that um, Herbert um, beautifully captures the sensibilities of the work with passages such as, and I think this will give you a great deal of insight into Fergus's work. So um, he writes, um, the, the eight compact works in his first London solo show operate most winningly and pleasurably in micro mode in accumulations of near subliminal pictorial events that reward an unhurried particle magnifying gaze. The works are hung um, diffidently low on the wall. You peer down into them, parsing their secrets. <laughs> um, so that was actually uh, my experience when I first encountered um, Fergus's work. So when I read that review, which is from 2011, so it's not yesterday, but it just, it just captured it so beautifully. I wanted to um, repeat some of it here tonight. Group shows, including um, Fergus's works, also across the globe, but for um, here tonight, um, for the sake of time, I will just, um, I'll just mention a few from the States and from actually quite close to home um, with the thought that some of you may have encountered the work at um, one of these exhibitions. Um, most recently, there was, um, a three-person show at Laura Reynolds Gallery in Austin just this past fall. Um, there was the exhibition titled Painter, Painter, which was critically acclaimed um, at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis in 2012. And of course, concentrations, Fergus Feely and Matt Connors at the DMA in 2011, which I know some of you saw and were quite moved by because I've had that conversation with a few of you. The DMA show is where I encountered Fergus's work, and um, it is when I determined that someday he would be here to talk about what Martin Herbert in Freeze, uh, described in Freeze as paintings that feel to have been rigorously tuned, arrested when they're no longer austere and not yet busy. This is that day, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the artist himself. So please join me in welcoming Fergus Feely. Uh, well, I'd like to say thanks to Terry for getting me here, um, and I'm really uh, very honored to be here, and uh, even more so after that uh, fabulous introduction. Uh, so thank you very much for all the team and everybody who's helped uh, get this uh, ready for tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, chronologically about work uh, this evening. I'm not really interested in chronology and thinking about my own work, uh, in that I think about uh, you know, something that I've made yesterday could sit beside something that I've made 10 years ago, 
or something that I've made five years ago, and that those sort of relationships between the works uh, are constantly creating kind of new meanings for what's happening in the work. Um, I have uh, spoken briefly before um, in Austin, and I, I said that my work uh, resists uh, success. And um, I kind of, I felt that perhaps um, being in Texas, maybe it fell flat somehow. Um, you know, uh, I mean, one of the great joys about being in America for me is this kind of feeling that, and I've always felt that ever since I've been coming here, that, you know, everything is possible, that there's a kind of very positive attitude to possibilities or whatever. So let me kind of clarify in a way what I mean by that. But what I mean in some, in some sense is that when I make something that I feel moderately somehow succeeds in some way or does something um, that I feel is interesting, I'm as likely to kind of make something that is that moves in a slightly different direction than, say, uh, sort of repeats what I've already made. So I'm constantly kind of shifting around in the work. Um, so if I've made something maybe very painterly or something like that, I'm maybe more likely the next moment to make something that maybe has no paint or that is an object in some way or, or, or something else. Um, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking also uh, this evening about, well, what is painting, you know? And I'm, I was thinking uh, that uh, soon enough, Frank Stella is going to speak here in an interview, and um, you know, he's, he's said that what you see is what you see. And this is, this is no doubt true about paintings, that what you see is what you see. One of the interesting things about paintings is that they are kind of a record of their own making. But I think it's also true to say that they are also kind of not. There's something more than that. Um, it's also true of his own work, I think. But you know, they, they can be illustrative, they can be suggestive, and they can, they can move you around in all sorts of different ways and make you think about all sorts of different things. So they are both what they are, but they're also perhaps more than that. I'm, I was also wanted to kind of talk maybe a little bit about um, maybe how I came to be an artist. And I, like many people, um, went to art school as a, I suppose initially as a kind of, um, I suppose a way not to do something, you know, in the real world. Um, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing there, but I was kind of sure that it was a space for freedom of some kind. Um, and, it, you know, I had, my, like, my, my formative uh, interests and, and experience of culture were, you know, were always about music and records. And as a teenager, I spent, you know, my whole teenage years kind of obsessively buying records, kind of sneaking them into the family house. I, I don't know where my father was imagining this kind of huge stack of vinyl was coming from, but, um, you know, so my, my experience of visual culture was there. I mean, I did sort of visit, say, the National Gallery in Dublin or uh, go to the Tate in London or something like that, you know, after I'd bought some records in Soho, of course. Um, so it was kind of when I went to art school, and one thing I'm trying to get at here is that I think anyone's kind of artistic life or an artist's career in some way is not, it's not them alone. It's a bunch of people, you know, and you meet people who kind of change things for you. So going to art school, I met people who are friends of mine today who introduced me to, to artists like Jasper Johns, things that I had no idea existed, you know. And it was kind of when I saw those things that you know, I started to kind of think, oh, this is, this is what I want to do, you know? I want to be that guy standing on a ladder kind of screwing some cans to something, you know, <laughs> in, in really cool linen pants. Um, uh, so, um, so, what I'm also gonna do this evening is that I'm gonna show you quite a bit of work, and perhaps when I've talked about work before, I have shown maybe 
fewer images than I'm going to show tonight. Um, but so I'm going to talk about some of them, maybe in a little bit of detail. Others I'm just going to show you, and they're just going to be there. Um, so um, I'm trying to think if there's something else before I get into the main images that I wanted to say to you. Um, no, I think that's good. Um, So I'd like to start with this very briefly. Um, sometimes at home, when the bath is filled and the light is just right, there is a reflection on the water from the small square window in the bathroom that looks out onto an enclosed courtyard. The large tree filling the external space ripples on the bath water and seems to me to be more interesting than the real view. It is intriguing that this image I find so fascinating is barely there or anything at all. It is almost nothing. This is um, part of a short text that I wrote for, for a gallery show. And instead of kind of having the standard press release, I decided to write a number of paragraphs that I felt sort of reflected the work somehow. And. Um, I start with this in a way because I feel it's very like the work. The work is, it's almost intangible. It's kind of hard to get to somehow. So I'll say no more about that text, but I think it, it, it says something about what I'm trying to do. This is a studio shot from 2008. And it shows two paintings. One is called Country, which is on the left. And the other one is called North Star on the right. Um, both use found elements um, and painting, uh, frames, and all sorts of different materials to make them. The, the painting on the, on the left, country, is made, uh, it's painted on, on plywood, um, but it also, this, this section on the lower left is the reverse of a found frame, as we say, uh, otherwise known as bought. Um, and I bought it for what was on the front of the frame. For me, what was, you know, which you're not seeing now. But when I turned it over, I realized that there was something there that was really intriguing to me. And this shape, this kind of weird elephine, elephantine, kind of country map-like shape. So in making this painting, I completely made the sort of the white pale panel, as it were, and made this drawing. And then reversed the panel and uh, took what a jigsaw to cut out the section where this frame goes into. And for me, it was quite important somehow that, that there was a kind of sense of jeopardy. You know, if the saw moved in the wrong way or it, the whole painting would have been ruined, the space would never have been there for this panel to fit into. Um, it's called Country. I think there's some, you know, I don't want to read too many things into, into the work. I like to let them sit there in a way and for people to experience that. But, you know, it's nonetheless true that there's some kind of sense of dislocation in this painting. There are two things that don't really glue together, but somehow are put together to make this whole. Um, there's a kind of a logic and a sort of illogical process going on in this painting, which I think you will see in, in, in many of the works. This painting is called uh, The Snowflake. And I made it uh, around the time that Terry is talking about where I did this show called Pavilion in the Douglas Hyde Gallery in, in Dublin. And I spent a long time um, making this show. I spent about a year making the work, thinking uh, about making a book for the show and, and making the work for the show. So it was, it was kind of one of those periods, like I suppose in a way kind of a golden period where you feel very immersed and you're not you're not maybe thinking of multiple projects or that this has to go here or that you're going to do this elsewhere. I kind of had one thing that I was focused on. So I ended up doing a lot of reading, a lot of research in a way. And that, that kind of very immersive process that I think uh, is one of the kind of the more pleasurable things about working in a studio. And uh, so I was reading, you know, the, the book I made references all sorts of things from Japanese death poems to Towns Van Zandt to uh, uh, medieval art, 
um, uh, the Yamanote line in Tokyo, all sorts of different things. Um, and in, in the book, it, it references uh, Johannes Kepler's The Six-Cornered Snowflake. And I found myself making this painting. Whether it's entirely related to that, who knows. But for me, it's, it's kind of, it's got a deep sense of fragility in a way. Um, it's made of three pieces. The panel that you see painted in a way, and the two, the two bars that are top and bottom. They were painted with the full intention that what you're seeing now would have been adhered to the panel. So in the process of making the work, I realized that what was the back of these uh, uh, sticks or battens should really be the front, so I reversed them. And in a way, it create, I think it even, it even intensifies the fragility of the work in a way. Um, also, this painting and a number of other paintings that I've made have screws that go through, as you can see in these four corners, and those screws go literally through the work and adhere the work to the wall. So there's two things maybe happening there. There's, who said that phrase of, you know, when you, when you say things for the first time, it's the truth, and when you say them the second time, it's a lie? I'm gonna feel a little bit like that tonight. But, you know, when, when you do something like that, there's a kind of what I have maybe referred to before as a kind of lowercase kind of violence to doing that to the work somehow, to do that to the painting. Also, you have a second thing in that, as someone was asking me about one of these works, they said, well, if I don't put the screws in, and I just want, like, is it the painting? And I was like, no, it's not the painting. Like, it has to be, it has to be adhered to the wall to almost exist, in a way. Um, so again, I think we get to this, this sort of um, area of my work of, like, almost does it exist? You know, ha like, it's almost this fragility to it, like, of how much it really exists in the world. Um, but at the same time, there's a kind of robustness to it too. It's very matter of fact. It's, it's three things that are glued together, that have screws going through them. They're using very ordinary things like plywood, wood, screws. You know, they're, they're quite matter of fact in a certain way. In a number of works that I've made, there there is this kind of issue of things covering paintings in a way. Or, as I have more often talked about it, revealing other parts of the work. People have often talked to me about this kind of hidden thing that's going on in the work. And I very often counter that, well, if there's something hidden, then something is also revealed. So this push and pull is also going on in the work somehow. So you could say that what's behind this front panel, which has got some hinges, and then it's glued down, so it's going at this angle. But it's also telling you something about the bits that you can see. Of course there is something you can't see. That's, that's uh, a big issue with it. This is called Sphinx. Now, maybe this is a moment to say a short note on scale. <laughs> um, some of you might have seen uh, my show uh, uh, when I showed in the DMA with Matt Connors. And, um, my work is, uh, what did I say in the art world, modest. Um, sometimes people say it's small. Um, um, so a lot of, the, nearly everything you're gonna see this evening is, uh, it's, it's really no, lo uh, no, no bigger than probably like 12 by nine inches or something like that. They're, they're, they're really kind of intimate things. And uh, I think one of the reasons I kind of gravitated towards that, I, did, I have made some bigger things, but, uh, and I may do again, um, but I think one of the, there's a couple of reasons I gravitated towards that. One was a kind of, I think, I started to view them as kind of head-sized or torso-sized, something to do with this kind of intimate uh, relationship you might have with another person, maybe. Um, but also, the, in truth, that, like, when I began to make these uh, smaller paintings, I think there was also for me, there was a kind of reaction to, to a kind of heroic kind of history of abstract painting somehow. And I mean, as much as I, I love a lot of that painting and I was seeing some of it today, um, but somehow, like when I was making paintings uh, kind of in the beginning, say, I suppose I began to kind of seriously make work in the, 
in the kind of mid 90s, I suppose I would say. And it was, it was really like, it was a very strange time to, well, first of all, to be an artist in Ireland. It's not, it, it's not a great idea. Um, you know, it was, the country was in deep recession. The idea of being an artist, I, I mean, it was really quite an odd thing to think about doing. I, I remember reading a, a, an interview with Mark Wallinger, um, who's kind of maybe a little bit older than I was, uh, um, and he was kind of saying something that he'd gone to this, this symposium or something in the Tate, and the symposium was about, about you know, is there, is there a future in being an artist? And he came out going, no. That, you know, it was concluded that, no, this wasn't a great idea. And of course, he proceeded and, and became an artist and did that, and uh, so have I. But so, so, first of all, there was that kind of issue to being an artist there. Also, there was a kind of thing at that time where I was interested in making things that were non-figurative, that uh, were abstract, non-objective, whatever term you want to use for those things. And it was not something that was very, it wasn't really happening at that time. There weren't many people making work like that, certainly not of my age. I can only think of one or two. And then there were a bunch of people that came up in London, but they were kind of making these process paintings. Um, and I wasn't interested in that much either. I kind of wanted the paintings to be more than just a process. You know, like I get a gutter and I can kind of scrape across something and I make that and then I make another one. I'll make one in pink. And I, you know, so I wanted, I wanted the paintings to maybe shift between poles more. So I was kind of searching for a long time of a way to do that. And also maybe one of the advantages for me in a weird way was that because I wasn't making, uh, I suppose, a kind, of, uh, a kind of new spirit of painting or a kind of uh, a figure of painting at that time, it kind of meant I was, a, for, for some time, I was quite below the radar. So it kind of meant I could develop, I suppose, ultimately my own kind of independent thinking about what I was doing. Um, um, so I'm like, as, I do make paintings and, um, you know, I am a painter, but I also, there's a kind of, I suppose another dangerous word to use here, perhaps there's a kind of promiscuous nature to what I'm doing. I, it moves around a lot and I, I will make paintings, but then I might show a photograph or an object or whatever that feels right to me that, that serves the work somehow. So I've, I've done a number of things where I've shown shelves or tables with objects in a kind of a, a constellation. This is called uh, uh, Meadow Table Other Places. And it has a number of books, objects, a toilet roll, scrunch paper, a twig. Um, and most importantly, perhaps, this table at the front, which is a table that was found in a meadow. And is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's really on the edge of collapse. You know, it's, it's, it's just teetering. And probably my work is a bit like that, and I am too. Um, this is a piece called uh, Lament, and um, it's made of two different things. There's a a painting on the top, as you might say, but the whole thing is a painting. A found cardboard box um, underneath, which is quite old and has some kind of relationship to a, a very old store that no longer exists in Dublin. Um, the painting is made of glitter on the front uh, on a plywood panel and then has all sorts of cloth that I've stapled to the back. Um, and when I was making this, um, something occurred to me about this kind of hidden back section that somehow this could become the front of something else. This piece, uh, which I showed in Masako and Rosen, is called uh, Lost and Found for SH, and is quite an odd thing in a way because it's, it's got this sort of L shape of plywood, like the front piece this longer piece, and then it's got all this material uh, that's stapled staple to it, and underneath this material are a number of hidden screw holes that go straight into the wall. So 
One of the odd things about viewing it maybe is that when you look at it even quite closely, you can't really figure out quite how, how it's there. Like how is it on the wall even? What is it in a way, you know? Um, it's also quite, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think some, like sometimes um, people talking about my work have, you know, they, they use words like modest and quiet uh, quite a lot. And I can see why, but, you know, there's a kind of, there's a, this is quite extrovert in a certain way, you know, it's, it's quite sort of out there, you know. But there's sort of something going on in this that is, I suppose, I, that I can recognize as a kind of, um, uh, and this is something that I'll probably keep coming back and forward to, but there's kind of something about sort of the systematic and the kind of the, the, the non-logical, the, the sort of, you know, the ordered and the sort of chaotic in a way. And I think a lot of work that I've made somehow um, acts around, you know, it does something with these two points. This is a, a piece called The End Again. Um, and again, I think there's a kind of similarity between this. I mean, I, 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 I was making this thing and I kind of felt, how, could, how, can you make, how can you make another painting that somehow uses the grid? It just seems so, I mean, it seems really dumb in a way and kind of, it just seemed kind of stupid in a way, but nonetheless, it was something that I was kind of, in a way, I felt kind of compelled to make this painting. Um, and in the process of making it, um, very often when I'm making these panels, and like one of the other images shows you that they're kind of constructed of these different things that glue together to make the, the, the paintings. Um, but in the latter stages of putting this whole painting together and laminating it or whatever, I had a, like a really dreadful accident with the painting and it was completely destroyed. Um, so, if I wasn't sort of stupid enough to make it the first time, uh, I then went ahead and made it again. Um, and that's kind of what this title is about. It's about this sort of sense of, well, it's about that sort of, that sort of possibility of finding something new in what seems to be an end in a way, and also about sort of uh, retrieving this painting somehow. So the, the damaged painting became a kind of a maquette for this painting, uh, a kind of drawing for it. And weirdly, of course, uh, I would probably claim so. This is more interesting than the one that went before. Um, this is a much older painting called Numbers from 2005. So um, over 10 years old. Um, it's made using uh, cookie cutters, uh, uh, children's cookie cutters, um, as a kind of template for the numbers. Um, and, you know, it has this kind of organic, but, non, but at the same time kind of ordered weirdness to it in a way. It's, it's, like, it's like a grid, but there is no grid. It's like order, but there is no order. Um, it's about numbers, but it's sort of illogical. And a number of things that I've done have got this sense to them. Did I skip over something very quickly there? Um, It's called Otherwares 2013. Um, and it's made of two elements in a way, this kind of handmade frame and this panel section in which I got a tailor in Berlin to, to stitch these materials for me together. Uh, she was very puzzled as to why I wanted to do that, but, um, but she did it nonetheless down to the millimeter. Um, it is Germany after all. This is called Crooked Look. And um, here we come to this issue of the found. The found is really important to me somehow. It's become increasingly important to the work. Um, and I think, you know, like when I was making work maybe initially, say in the, in the, in the, in the 90s maybe, I, I, was, I was making these kind of monochrome paintings that were indeed very similar looking to each other. They were kind of, you know, to the untrained eye, they looked very similar to each other. And somehow, I, uh, I kind of, when I went to Japan and took time to think about what I was doing, I kind of wanted to, 
I wanted the work to become, in one sense, more complex, and perhaps have a great, like a greater ability to be about anything, or that I could make a, a work out of any material or in any way that I wished. I wanted this kind of um, uh, freedom in a way in the work, but I don't mean in that it is boundless. There's a lot of parameters there, but I wanted it to be expansive and kind of open to the world. So uh, it wasn't so much in Japan, but after Japan, I started to to get interested in in using things that I found that I found like that felt to me that they were almost something, and with some very minor modifications somehow that they would become a piece. Um, so this is a found frame. Uh, it's, it's completely skewed. It's, no, it's only straight on one side. All the other sides are incorrect. And then I've made this addition to the back where I've painstakingly made another frame that adheres to the back, which is, which is sprayed. So you've got this kind of weird kind of activation of the, of the side of the painting. Um, also, I would say here, it's really important to mention that the frame is not, it's not a frame in the sense of a frame in a normal sense. It is the work. It is part of the work. It's as much part of the work as the side or the paper that's contained within it. What's inside the frame is a, a painted piece of paper on the lower and unpainted paper at the top. Um, so there's a kind of, there's a weird play also maybe in this work between a kind of, um, this, this slightly uh, kind of extrovert nature of the, the side of the work and this kind of uh, absence or kind of <coughs> emptiness perhaps in the middle. Uh, this is a painting that has no paint and uh, I think it was one of, the, one of the paintings that Martin Herbert was uh, referring to in the piece that uh, Terry referred to there. Um, and although it has no paint, perhaps the, the material that I've used to make the painting out of, which is actually the inside of an old drawer, um, it, it is already sort of painted. It's painted with patina, it's painted with water stains, um, and that I've only had to do some minor things in a way to kind of activate it somehow. Um, so. Things like this sort of material hang around the studio maybe sometimes for, for years and then I find a use for them. I, I don't really know what they're for, I just know that they're for something and then at some stage they kind of come into play. I mean often of course there are the, the real orphans that don't come into play. Um, they're the ones that we should feel sorry for. Um, so it is simply a piece of wood and a piece of cloth and some panel pins. So it is what you see, but it is also not, perhaps. This is a piece called Strange Mountain. Uh, it's from 2008. And again, it involves cloth, um, a frame, and a painted panel. And while these things, in a way, are, they can appear, I think, in one sense, quite simple when you see them in, in, the, in a space, in a, uh, in a gallery or a museum, they are actually both kind of conceptually uh, uh, and physically maybe quite complex things. And I'm just going to show you this short series of images here. This is how the painting is put together. Uh, it doesn't really exist until it's made, and it has to be remade to be shown. It cannot travel as it is in the first image. It was in a show in California, and the curator described it as a Mensa test, uh, which is why I made these photographs. <laughs> she didn't have those photographs. Um, Um, this is a really, really small painting. Uh, even, even to me, it's quite small. 
Um, it's no bigger than kind of half this sheet of paper here. And it's called Pavilion. And it's one of the pieces I made for that Douglas Hyde show. And there's something for me that is, in one sense, you could say that somehow something has been sealed here. We have a frame. We have a very thin piece of plywood. Uh, and we have this painted card that's inside the frame. And in one sense, as I say, you could see that something has been sealed off from you. But for me, there's something, uh, something weirdly open about this painting. It's actually about openness and not about closeness to me. Um, it's about invitation. It's about openness. Um, it's about possibilities rather than closure or sort of something being sealed off. Um, I think one of the things about the work uh, that um, is kind of hard to get across in a way when, when, when you're doing one of these things is the kind of the, the complex nature of the relationships between these different paintings and these different objects and the sort of thought processes uh, that leads you to make them. Um, and some of the things that I'm trying to do is to kind of find, I suppose, a way of essentially, I suppose, saying similar things, but in very different ways, and to try and get at something that is, um, that is sort of very simple in a way, but come at it in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I think this is one of the, the reasons that I'm trying to use this very broad language of making things that I'm trying to, uh, like I'm, one of the things I feel very, very resistant to uh, is kind of making the same thing kind of over and over again. And in a way, there are many artists that, uh, that I admire greatly who in one sense have kind of done that and I really admire this incredible sort of tenacity they have to pick away at this small area and kind of eke out everything that can be done with that. Um, but I have found myself wanting to, um, wanting to make things in so many different ways, you know, whether it be a painting or to bring objects into play. Um, and I'm really, really concerned also with sort of how things are, um, how they're installed in a space. I'm very interested in, I suppose, the idea also of curating one's own work in a way, you know? So while I'm, of course, like most artists, I'm making work that's going to be in a certain show, um, I'm, also, I'm also deeply interested in sort of bringing these different works together, you know, in publications, uh, and so on and so forth. And as Terry uh, ha, um, very nicely referred to there, I have uh, I've written a number of texts uh, for for publications, which I don't really know what their uh, what their uh, status is as art, but I don't I don't discount them as being maybe a piece somehow either. You know, so I'm kind of thinking. Um, I, like in a way, I think a little bit of Factory Records uh, in Manchester, who, you know, famously had a, uh, they had kind of um, catalog numbers for for like you know I think the boardroom table and and you know the the the, the dog in the office and stuff like that. So I'm kind of thinking about all these different elements as being part of the work, and I've made uh, a number of um, artists publications, artist books. Um, I made a zine very recently uh, with Masako Rosen in Tokyo. And um, I'd like to uh, show you as a way of kind of finishing up, but hopefully opening up some conversation, because I'd really be open to that, to show you some images of, uh, of a show that I very recently did in Capitol in San Francisco. It's a really small space on the edge of Chinatown. Um, and uh, the show consists of four things. There's this piece on the left, 
uh, which is called uh, a Dusk in Winter, which is a piece of found card. Um, there's a sculpture, I, I find, yeah, sculpture, I don't know. Uh, a piece in the middle called uh, uh, North American Informal. Uh, the pink painting on the right is called The Living Monastic. And then there was this found photograph which I had on this shelf, uh, which is, I'm not gonna show you uh, because it maybe just opens up too many weird areas right now, but it, it's, it's, of a, it's of an acrobat guy that I found in Berlin, and he's, he's kind of cycling on a unicycle, and he's got a kind of, some kind of weird handmade pot on his head, and he's kind of falling towards the camera. And I bought this at a flea market in Berlin, and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. It's, you know, that's, that's weird and interesting. And then I kind of realized, as I had it much longer in a drawer in the studio, that actually there's another figure in the photograph. There's a kind of second figure in the shadow, kind of. So there's this couple, in a way, making this weird falling apart, failure kind of artwork. Um, and uh, so let me talk a tiny bit about these. Um, so yeah, this is living monastic, and uh, there's something, um, this again, I mean, this is something that maybe happens with the work quite a lot. Certain things are intended to be a certain way, and they kind of show you in the making that they shouldn't be that way. So the panel, the front panel of this painting was intended to be part of a different kind of painting, where I was gonna paint uh, a frame with this sort of slightly camouflage-like marking or uh, slightly weirdly organic marking that would have gone on top of this painting. And as I made it, I began to be really interested by these weird sort of white edges on the painting. The fact that they kind of dissipate into the wall. And, and I think a lot of the work that I'm making is very, very sensitive to its sort of existence in the world, where it ends, where the wall begins, where the exhibition ends, begins. They're really kind of diffuse, but I'm really interested in these tiny, minute details, I suppose, of what an artwork is. So when you're looking at this painting head on, for example, there is this slightly odd confusion of kind of going, where, you know, where does it go off? Is it, is it curved? Does it, you know, what's happening there? Um, and again, I think, uh, and this wasn't something I was kind of intending to talk about this evening, but there is this kind of push and pull between the, the slightly extrovert, maybe, in some way, and this more quiet, kind of uh, meditative, um, uh, and, you know, well, yeah, quiet, <laughs> that's a good word, aspect to the work. Um, it's called Living Monastic. This is a detail of North American informal, and it consists of this stick that comes out of the wall. It has this papier-mâché form, uh, which is painted, um, which it balances on the stick uh, and into the space. And so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's barely there. I mean, it, it is absolutely tiny. I mean, the ball itself is like this, you know? So it's really tiny, but it has this kind of weird and great presence in the space somehow. Um, it's both coming out at you into the space, but at the same time, it's completely non-aggressive and sort of open and sort of like, you know, and gentle in a way. Um, so it's kind of, there's an odd quality to it in a way. Um, and in a way, this is something that I kind of wanted to get to towards the end of this, that. One of the ways that I kind of view my work, and I've been thinking about this a lot, I suppose, as you would, um, is that the work that I'm making is a bit like, kind of, they're a bit like clouds. Like clouds come in all sorts of different forms. You know, you've got your uh, cumulus, and you know, you've got all these different cloud formations. And you can categorize them in different ways, but essentially they're the same material, they're the same thing. They're, they're, made, they're made of the same thing. They're made of water vapor. And that process of cloud formation is something that is cyclical. You know, the clouds are made, and then they dissipate and they rain onto the earth, and 
they go back up again and they're remade. And in a way, I think the work is really like that. It's kind of, the forms may be seemingly different, but they are all the same thing. And they are kind of, the, the, the ideas and the materials that I'm using are constantly kind of being reused to, to remake the work all the time in a way. Um, and in a way, I would like to leave it there and open it up to any questions, thoughts, observations, uh, as you may or may not have them. Um. I'll start. Did you mean to put these clouds there purposely or this by chance? In what sense? Are the clouds there by design or for the talk? Uh, in the talk? No, they're, yeah, they're there by design. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. And the picture that we had with the pink one, and you said it was half the size of the page, I could see like a woman with a burqa. Mm -hmm. So her eyes only show. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, that's maybe not an odd thing to say. I, I, um, there's also a piece um, in the, the beginning kind of film slideshow that I, I showed. I don't know if it came up there because I, I kind of left it as this floating thing that would be there while I'm talking. Um, but there's another piece that I've made that has a photograph inside of a woman with plywood going yes. across. Yeah. So this, um, it's not something I was consciously thinking of, but I can see that that's maybe an interesting thing to say about them. And, you know... Uh, and you see them, but you can't see them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people can get fixated on what is not seen. And, of course, we're getting into a kind of political area here. But, you know, at the same time, something is also seen. You're seeing somebody's eyes. So maybe, you know, maybe we can think about that too. We may be denied a certain view of somebody, but we're also being offered something else, you know? But it's not something I was kind of consciously thinking of. And another thing is in the talk was told of the size, the same thing looked different. When we, I saw the slides, yeah. and when you would mention the size, yeah, okay. then yeah. the same thing looked different. Yeah, I mean, size, you know, size matters, you know? <laughs> it does, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it has a meaning. Everything, you know, everything has some kind of implication, I think, in the world, you know? Uh, you talked a little bit about your work resisting success, which I love, especially in Texas. <laughs> um, but I was wondering how you feel about your work. Do you think it ever resists being photographed? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I think it does, uh, as probably as evident tonight. Uh, it, it is really hard to photograph, actually. And... Um, you know, and actually, in a way, it's something that, you know, again, I might have said at the beginning, it, I mean, such, it seems like such an obvious thing to say when anyone is talking about their work like this, but what we are looking at are images of these works. And with everyone who's doing these talks, you're, you're, unless maybe the work is made in some digital way like that, you are really looking at some kind of facsimile of the thing. And I think... I think that's something we've become less and less conscious of the more and more kind of access we have to images, the internet, and the availability, and the fact that we all take, you know, hundreds of pointless photographs every day. You know, we've become very unaware that these things are not, they're not the work, you know? So it's not something, I'm not consciously trying to resist photography or something like that, but it, it, they are really difficult to photograph. and you kind of have to get a sympathetic relationship with certain people to do that because there's certain ways that I do and don't like them photographed. People can photograph them in a really harsh way. I, you know, I like to soften shadows. I, I'm doing all sorts of weird things like placing cards in to bounce light up. And, you know, sometimes when people photograph them, it's as if they're kind of photographed, I don't know, like in a nightclub at sort of 4 a.m. or something. You know, it, it can feel very cold and harsh in a way. So. And, and that brings us to the issue that all, like all of those photographs would be the, of the same work. So if I showed them in a lecture or a talk or something, they would all be that work, but none of them are that work, you know? So it's kind of important, what you're saying, I think is very important, actually. I love that, thank you. <coughs> 
Fergus, um, on your, um, you may have actually touched on this, but I kept um, being attracted to these points of contact in your work. Um, and um, I think you did actually address the fact that they're, for the most part, conscious. But I, I wondered if that was an instinct for you to have these things that butt up against each other, whether it was the old table and the extension of the new table, or it was just a, almost in every piece. I just kept being taken back with that. I know, yeah. Um, I don't know how... how it, probably some of it is conscious now, I suppose, but I think some of these things, like, I... Some of these things are, are just a sensibility, I think. You know, um, I, I read a, a, very, a very interesting interview with this um, uh, British artist and musician called Mark Fell, uh, who I think is very kind of conceptually tight guy. And, you know, at the end of the interview, somebody was asking him about, you know, it's very interesting all the different things you're saying, but what about this aspect of how clean the work seems to be, the sound is very clean, there's no distortion, whatever. And he, he just said, well, I just like it like that. You know? And in a way, he was kind of getting at something profound also, where there were certain things that he could kind of rationalize and uh, kind of, uh, and, it, and some of the things that he could realize, well, this is just somehow my sensibility. But I think I am interested in this, I think on a conceptual level, I am interested in things joining, because something's happening when things join, when one thing goes onto another thing or beside another thing. Um, but I think, so that's one aspect to it, but also I think from the very earliest stages of making any kind of work, even in the, like when I, before I was really kind of, I suppose what I would say now as an artist, I was, I was really interested in sort of joining things. It was just something, like, right from the very beginning, I was kind of gluing things together and putting panels together and stuff like that. So that has somehow remained, I think, in the work, you know? Well, that's why I asked, because it, even though it seemed like the things you were saying would suggest that, it was con that it's conscious, it feels like you're doing it instinctively in the work. It feels like an instinct. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it kind of primarily is um, and there's certain aspects, of course, with these uh, works where, you know, where there's a panel going across something or it's sealing off or revealing uh, the rest of the, the painting. That obviously is much more conscious in a way that I've, but a lot of it is a kind of, um, I'm interested in a kind of, um, also I suppose a kind of, a, a kind of make and do quality to them of like putting stuff together and making things, you know, out of things, you know. Um, and I'm interested in the fact that, in a way, my work kind of reveals itself to be, in a way, sort of simply made. I mean, they're not really, because it, it actually, it takes all sorts of weird processes to get to that thing. But in a certain way, you kind of can go, oh, that's screwed to that, and that goes on that. Or, as you say, that this table is made with an extension that is new, and it goes to the wall. You know, so I'm interested in that sort of like that they kind of, they tell you that. That's what this is, you know. Um, there's a kind of simplicity to that that I like, that very little of that is hidden in a way. You know? that, that idea of not hiding, um, do, do you, have you um, thought about that aspect of the work's relationship with the work of Richard Tuttle? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, he, he's somebody that I suppose is... Uh, is somebody that's always been interesting to me, or certainly, well, not always, because I didn't know of his work at all until, um, I suppose, sometime in the 90s or whatever, when I saw a show of his. Um, but I think there, I don't know whether maybe the, the kind of revealing and unrevealing, whether that maybe is a relationship there, but I think we both have a kind of sensibility about materials and kind of um, uh, how very simple and ordinary things can become something kind of more than that, somehow kind of extraordinary in a way, you know? Um, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have an observation about, uh, and it, it, it is an observation about you and your work, and that there seems to be a, an incredible generosity that, and freedom about it, that invites the viewer 
to make our own interpretation, our own story about what we're seeing. And because we are given the freedom to do that, we learn something about ourselves as we view the work. So there's a lovely, complicated freedom and generosity for me in, in you and your work. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> when you use uh, found objects or you just bring objects to life again, I would say, and then you compare this to the clouds that they have water and then reborn. So when you do your work, you feel, you feel that you've finished it completely or it can be something else later on? Um, I think the works I feel are finished, and I, I, with some very rare exceptions, I don't go back and sort of remake something. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think maybe ideas and sort of processes and 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 sort of uh, things that you might be trying to communicate or get at is what's sort of getting reworked and sort of recycled in a way. And so in a way, the whole idea of that sense of the clouds in a way, I think is more like a metaphor for the whole process of what I'm involved in rather than maybe, of course, some materials do get reused. And maybe this is, maybe, maybe this gets at it in that, um, um, say one of these things I showed earlier, this, this thing dovetail, which has this odd kind of shape like this in the cloth, the, this came from making another painting and that I, I got this drawer, this wooden drawer, with the idea that I would use the sides to make some kind of something. It doesn't really matter what it was. So the, the actual residue of that process was then sort of sitting in my studio, sitting in a drawer, <laughs> a clean one in this case. And, you know, so... So in a way, the kind of residue of one thing did turn into another thing. So it, it is a bit like that. So like, that's almost like I'd imagine is like the, the and I, I, you know, one shouldn't go too far with metaphors or whatever, but that's like the stuff falling down. It's like, you know, you're left with something and then that turns into something else, you know? And there's also kind of, I think in the studio, there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of an economy there that I, I try and find, I try and do something with things, you know? It might take, it might take 10 years or something, but you know, I kind of feel like, oh, I'll need that for something, you know? I mean, it's the bane of my life as well, because then I have all this stuff, you know? Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah? Um, you said you like to collect records a lot. Does listening to music influence your music? or your work in any way? Does that kind of play into anything? I'm sure it does. I mean, I think everything does in a way, you know? Um, and actually, I've made a couple of pieces where I've used, I've used the record in the work, like uh, kind of covered in a drawing. Um, and I've referenced music in various different ways, I think, in, in, in works. Um, as I say, there was these Towns Van Zandt lyrics in, uh, in the Pavilion book for the Douglas Hyde. Um, but yeah, I think everything does, and, and I, I don't really draw much distinction between, between art forms or, or ways of making work. You know, so, um, you know, uh, a record by, I don't know, whatever, the Dead Sea from New Zealand or something, or, or some, you know, uh, techno record or something made in Berlin or something can have an effect on me and how I think about things just the same as, you know, seeing a sculpture or, or a painting or something like that. So, so undoubtedly it has, but in, in all sorts of complicated ways, I'm sure. You teach. What are the key things you want your students to take away? Uh, independence of thought. That's like that is my that's kind of the bottom line. Um, yeah, that's kind of the main thing. I do have a question too. Thank you very much for the talk tonight. Uh, some of your works I saw what would Blinky Palam would do today. 
so then I think he maintained, in, often in cases, smaller works, but he has had a broader range between installation bigger work and the smaller work. Uh, may I refer to your face you mentioned from Frank Stella? You see what you see, and we just checked you on the phone, it's around the 70s. And I'm, I'm very concerned on that sentence in relation to your work. You see what you see is not so easy to understood as perhaps it seems to be. And when I see your work, it's, it's kind of, I have an idea as a recipient of your work, how these parts come together. Mm. So you look and I guess that sentences, how you see what you see 70, uh, 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 in the 70s has a different demand or challenge as today and how we can look into a work, and that is my question to you, where we see the potential of, an, of each of the elements, as you explained that in your lecture, how they can come together that makes that unit you want to have. And the recipient looks at that work and questioning again this idea of the unit coming along of these elements how you treat them or how you put them together. Does it make a sentence for you on that question too? Um, I think it's very interesting what you're saying, but I'm not sure so I'm what... Very concerned. I, I'm so challenged with this sentence from Frank, Frank Stella that I think what Frank Stella said to that time counts today differently, period. That is, and from up there, I'm asking you the question, what that sentence could mean today, mm. and myself, I gave a proposition for you there, I oh, yeah. we can negotiate that, yeah. what it is that makes up this unit out of these very different pieces, mm. that in some or another way, an audience accepts and say, yeah, that's a unit. And how is this when we would imagine your studio, how is it that surrounded of these elements, makes up to a certain circumstances that these elements might get together. And I think that is the curiosity you challenge in me as I see your work. That's very interesting. And can you perhaps get a little bit an insight of it? Is it just the elements that are the elements that can into a certain function, function from a, to another element as they didn't have the function? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things I think you're getting at there. Um, um, so, I mean, the, there's there's a number of layers there that I think are interesting. Um, this this idea of the, the Frank Stella quote, it's only something that sort of kind of occurred to me yesterday in a way, and I was kind of thinking about the fact that he would be speaking here and uh, and that he would be showing here. I, I would very much like to see this show. Um, what I meant by that is that it, I think it was a very kind of um, profound comment, uh, um, statement at the time, and it, it's nonetheless true. I mean, one thinks about, um, you know, uh, much of, say, the concrete art of, of the Rhineland or something like that, and, and that sort of tradition uh, of uh, that you're looking at something that has no other suggestion in the world other than it is this thing and you don't need to think outside that you don't need to start thinking well what you don't even need to start thinking well what does this thing mean you should just look at it and realize that it is there um, now that is true and in a way it's almost how I it's almost how I uh, experience most art it's it's kind of how I deal with, in some ways, even a Fra Angelica or something. It's kind of how I see it. I see it as a thing there. I very, like, I very often can look at these pieces and I do not think, I don't even think that there's a man slaying a dragon. I just, I'm just looking at the physical object in a way. So this, this thing is true, but I think, but I think one of the things that's also true, and I'm slightly, I, I'm thinking also of uh, Jan Vervoort, um, who's a, a writer, uh, 
who has talked about these Stella pieces and kind of said, yeah, that is true, but there's also something kind of, what did he say? There's something kind of trippy also going on with these black paintings. So uh, there's something that, and I think this is, this is one of the really interesting things about painting in a way, is that even when you get down to this idea of this is what it is, that it's a little bit like that sort of idea that we're kind of getting to, that even sort of nothing doesn't, it isn't nothing, there's something in there. So I kind of feel that even when you say, well, this is this concrete thing, it is what it is, that it isn't quite, there's something else. And I think, I think that one of the great things about making, making paintings in a way is this kind of, these poles between the physical object of the painting and the sort of suggestions of what that, you know, what it's doing to you, what it might mean, what it might refer to, but maybe it doesn't refer to anything, but maybe it does. You know, those kind of poles I find really interesting. Uh, and it's, it's something that I suppose I'm consciously, um, I really don't like the word playing, but I'm going to use it because I can't find another one at the moment. But it, it's something that I'm kind of playing with these two poles somehow. Um, uh, am I answering your question? Ish. Um, and so the other thing I kind of think about what you said there is, you know, do you mean how the materials kind of form a particular piece? Or how all these things form something that has some meaning, is it? I think it's both sides. Yeah. <laughs> I was afraid you might say that. Um, uh, uh, how, how, you know, how the actual physical materials form one painting or one piece of work is a really weird process. Um, uh, you know, I remember, I remember seeing some other artists being interviewed and somebody said, how did you make that? And he kind of went, oh, you you don't want to know. Um, so they come together, the individual things that make a painting through um, serendipity, through uh, conscious looking at things, trying to make things, uh, putting things together. Often it's some act of serendipity, something happens. But how, how, the, how the works form an overall whole, I feel they really do. I feel I'm making something that has this sort of uh, kind of overarching feel to it. Um, although I, I, at times I realize that sometimes for people it can feel confusing somehow, that things do go off in different directions, that they're in the same space, they're in the same room. Um, but for me, it's a bit like these poles between the concrete and the suggestive. I, I really like that sort of sense of um, ambiguity in a way that these things are making a whole but it's kind of sometimes hard to see how they are but I think you kind of instinctually know they are um, and I think kind of people can recognize my work when they see it although it may be a kind of thing that they haven't ever seen me do before I think you know like that is you know who knows but some people have said that to me so you know Thanks. Anything else, sir? <laughs> yeah, I just, you guys work real long hours. How, how is the process when you start making a picture or something? I never stopped. You know, like you know, um, artists are always working and never working. You know, that's uh, like that's kind of my life. You know, uh, I think you know. Um, Obviously, you teach, too. Sorry? You teach also. Yeah. Yeah, well, I try to. <laughs> uh. That was great. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Thanks.